University of Kerala and also the director of the Center for Cultural Studies at the University of Kerala, Thiruvananthapuram. She writes extensively about the cultural politics of Kerala's modernity, popular culture's negotiation of Kerala's gender histories, Indian cinema's shaping of the national imaginary and the transformations of Kerala's gender cultures in the age of new media. She edited the book Women in Malayalam Cinema, Naturalizing Gender Hierarchies. Her essays have appeared in prominent academic journals and as a part of anthologies. She also contributes to leading newspapers and magazines. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome, sir. This is a very rare honor. Uh, I deem it a privilege to be in conversation with you. It's a fascinating read, that book of, you know, yours which is called Memoirs of a Maverick. For those of you who haven't seen this, I think you should get to see it and read it. Because it's not just about the memoirs itself, but I also feel that it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a document on the first 50 years of India's freedom, you know, till liberalization, roughly. So, roughly five decades of the social and political history of India, where you also meet some very, very interesting men and women, you know, very fascinating, variegated, uh, colorful, uh, enigmatic kinds of personalities. The book is people with such characters. Uh, what impelled you to write a book of this kind, sir? Um. Nothing impelled me. In fact, I would never have written this book because I didn't know why my life should be of any interest to anybody. But uh, as I've said in my introduction, the publisher, Chiki Sarkar, she suddenly sprang the suggestion to me that I should write my biography, uh, my autobiography, and Sonia Gandhi, who was present on that occasion, she enthusiastically agreed. So at that point, I realized that she had no plans for me anymore. And therefore, I would be unemployed if I didn't take up this offer. But it took me about uh, four or five years before I uh, found myself enthused enough to put pen to paper. And once I started typing, there was no end to it. It ended with half a million words. And um, my publisher was simply horrified. She said, I asked for your memoirs and you've given me more in peace. Now, I was not willing to let much of it go. So eventually we compromised on a three volume exercise. So this is the first volume, The Memoirs of a Maverick. The second volume, relates to the period that I spent with Rajiv Gandhi when he was prime minister and then leader of the opposition and then he was assassinated. And the third volume is about my life as a, polit as a politician in the years after Rajiv Gandhi. And I've called it a half-life in politics because uh, with regard to radioactivity, the theory is that radioactivity has a half-life because it glows for a while and then starts petering out and then finishes completely. So I did have my period in politics and then it started spluttering and today it doesn't exist. So I'm able to find time to come to a literary fest. So would you say that it is not a labor by choice but a labor by compulsion because uh, you particularly cite that comment of Sonia Gandhi's that, you know, maybe you should write the book. It was at that point that I realized that she had no plans for me. So if she had no plans for me and my heart was still beating, then I had to occupy myself some way. But then came COVID. And if it was largely because of the COVID lockdown that I was able to write the book, so at one point, I thought I would dedicate it to COVID-19, but people were horrified at that suggestion, and therefore it's dedicated to a friend of mine 
who said that I speak the same language as Nehru, yes, and I've never been more flattered than that. And therefore, I think your point that it, is, it does coincide to a very large extent, if you are not too accurate about figures, if you leave out the six years when I was a British colonial subject and have no memory of it, uh, the following years were indeed the years of, the first years of India's independence. I became, uh, I, or rather, I was six years old when India became independent and had Jawaharlal Nehru as its prime minister. I was 23 years old when I joined the foreign service and Jawaharlal Nehru died. So my entire upbringing was during that era and I've been so profoundly influenced by the Nehru era that uh, I am today something of a Jurassic Park because I belong to the pre-Manmohan Singh era and all my ideas are absolutely rooted in what I would call Nehruvian secularism. I particularly like the title of the book, Memoirs of a Maverick. Now, do you think of yourself as a maverick? But because when you look at, you know, the, as an English professor, maverick is more about dissent and uh, a, a kind of a radical stand against uh, authority offices. But you have occupied offices, you have occupied positions of power. So how do you yoke these things together? It was a question that, you know, I really wanted to raise with you. If you look at a dictionary, there are many, many meanings given to maverick. But the one that uh, appealed to me, and which is how I use it, is somebody who does his own thing. Yeah. Now, I really did my own thing, even in choosing this title, because the family was simply horrified that I should describe myself as a maverick. And yet I thought that that was the word that suited me best, because I've done all kinds of things that one would not do in the normal course. For example, leaving the Foreign Service, just when I was, my career was coming to some kind of a climax in it. But I did it, although I neither had a language, nor did I have a constituency, nor did I have family connections in politics, nor did I have any money. But I did have Rajiv Gandhi, and I thought if I don't jump now, I'll never jump. And uh, I, ha I, I also owe a great deal to my wife who had asked me many years earlier why I wanted to go into politics on retirement. If I wanted to be in politics, why not now? And I was a bit startled at that suggestion because we have three children, they had to be educated, and where was I going to do it, especially if I didn't win an election? But things worked out in such a way that I made the leap without asking her, and then she endorsed the opinion very strongly. It was my brother Swaminathan, who's a well-known journalist, who was dead against it. I asked him why. And he said, oh, you're going to go to jail with Rajiv Gandhi. So why do you want to go out of the foreign service and into politics? So I said, I didn't think Rajiv Gandhi would go into jail. And for once in my life, I was proved wrong, right, and he was proved wrong. I think uh, early in the book you speak about Nayanta Rasagar calling your uh, language very yeah. similar to that of Nehru's language. It's a huge compliment, you know, being said that, especially by somebody like Nayanta Rasagar. Not, so not only did she say it, she dedicated, dedicated the book. an entire book to me saying, for the, who speaks the same language as Jawaharlal Nehru. And since she is... Uh, Nehru's niece yes. and was, uh, she's much older than me, so she was, she was in her 20s when Mahatma Gandhi died and she was there in Birla House at that time. So to have somebody who is so connected to Nehru saying to me that uh, I speak the same language as that, it was such a huge compliment and it was she who said, she was horrified when I said, I'm going to dedicate it to COVID-19. So I said, in that case, I'll dedicate it to you. And that's how it came to be dedicated to her. No, but I just don't think about it as 
a compliment that was topical because over the last few decades, speaking the language of Nehru means a lot more, I no, think. No, it means yeah. being a maverick. Because we seem to have abandoned the Nehruvian tradition in almost every aspect of nation building. And I think it started with the economic reforms of 1991, which I must say Dr. Manmohan Singh was very particular in pointing to continuity because even Nehru had always said that economic policy should be adjusted according to the changing times. And it was his policies that had taken us out of utter stagnation and onto the path of growth. And if he had not laid the foundations that he did, and we had suddenly announced that we were going to be a liberal economy, I think we'd have been sunk. But there were such strong foundations laid in Nehru's time that uh, the, the reforms followed logically out of that. The problem is that there were, and there continue to be uh, growing, a very large number of people who are so deadly opposed to the Nehruvian philosophy that it was they who portrayed Manmohan Singh's reforms as a kind of break from the past. And I don't buy that argument at all because Nehru was never a communist and he was a socialist in a purely Indian way. And what is that Indian way? He allowed the largest segment of the Indian economy, which is agriculture, to continue in private hands, but with land reforms. Now, in the case of Russia, for instance, Soviet Russia, the largest sector of the economy was agriculture, and they virtually nationalized it by collectivizing it. And Nehru refused that collectivization. And when it came to the nationalization of industry, there was very little that he did, except perhaps with regard to Air India. The other big companies of the pre-British uh, days the Birlas, the Dalmias, uh, the Tatas, they were not touched at all. It was the new fields for which we didn't have the technology and we didn't have the capital that he said the state should be put at the commanding heights of the economy. And that is why in all the infrastructure areas uh, and the basic heavy industry areas, the state grew. And today, I don't think Adani would exist if we did not have the, uh, the Steel Authority of India or the Indian Ports Authority. Those were the pioneers. It is they who laid the foundations. And today, Mr. Modi puts on the light bulb and says he's last bulb, and he says, I've electrified the country. Well, he couldn't put on the last bulb unless somebody else had put on all but the last bulb. And so, we, our economic story is one of continuity over a period of time after the stagnation that marked colonial times. And there's a figure, I don't like quoting figures, <coughs> but it was estimated by Angus Madison that our growth rate from 1914 to 1947 was 0.72% per annum. That has been raised upwards by Shiva Subramanian and others who say it was 1.22. But in Nehru's first few years, we went up from 0 0.72 to 3.5. Now that's seven times. And it's such an amazing achievement that if we had maintained his, the Nehruvian rate of growth, we would today be growing at 21% or even more, perhaps 42%. And so, I think it's very, very wrong to divide the history of India into the Nehruvian period of stagnation and the post-Nehruvian period of growth. It's not at all that story. And I was part and parcel of the reforms movement. Uh, that is in my last volume, which is still to come. But, and so I won't, uh, I won't go into that. Yeah, but I'm a little but, curious, sir. 
Since you mentioned the PM and you mentioned some of the new things that are coming up, I'm a little curious to know, within the Congress, is there a possibility of retrieving that stand of, you know, Nehruvian philosophy and working on it towards, you know, new possibilities? You know, I am an Iyer, but I'm not, a, I'm not an astrologer. So I, look, I can't really look into the future and say this will happen or that won't happen. But the chances of its happening, the chances of rendering the Congress Nehruvian are very slight for two reasons. One, the Nehruvian era is over. It was over when? It was over 50 years ago. So we can't be driving backwards. But there are some fundamental values of which I regard unity in diversity as the single most important value. And I regard Calicut as an example of that. I mean, you see even the girls who are wearing these yellow t-shirts, the Muslim girls have their hijab around their, their scarves around their heads, and nobody even notices. And yet, just next door, what a big issue it has been made. So therefore, unless we respect our unity in diversity, I don't think India can last. And it is the threat to India that has to be challenged by not a return to Nehruvian policies, but to Nehruvian values, so that we build up policies that conform to those values. And of those values, the single most important is unity in diversity, out of which we have to have respect for all religions and all cultures and all languages. And that, that idea of India has been under assault for the last 10 years. And I think India today is much more emotionally disintegrated than it was in 2014. And if this trend continues, then we'll either move towards a vicious dictatorship <coughs> or we'll move towards the disintegration of India. So a return to the basic values of <coughs> our freedom movement is, I think, the single most important imperative, especially in this year of 2024, when we have an opportunity before us, which we don't seem to be availing of, but we have an opportunity before us of reversing this aberrant trend that has entered our polity and our society and our civilization over the last 10 years. Thank you. I think that's a very, very pertinent point that you raised. I wanted to ask the question, the question that I'm going to raise now a little later on, but since you mentioned dictatorship, I think in the journey of your career as a diplomat, you were in three countries that were under dictatorships, right? Vietnam, Iran, and Pakistan. Iraq. Ira sorry, Iraq and Pakistan. Vietnam, Iraq, Iraq and, and Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah, three countries. So how did you look at these dictatorships, you know, when you were in these respective countries and, you know... There has been a tendency in the 21st century to go in for democracy or at any rate for democracy uh, in many, many countries. <coughs> but this was not true of the British colonial period or the colonial period as a whole, when in fact, uh, authoritarian regimes were the worst gift that the West gave to the East. And so it's unsurprising that when these uh, leaders of the freedom movements became heads of their respective governments, they tended to go back to an authoritarian model. India was the grand and great exception. And that was because I think Nehru particularly, but Gandhi too, had been deeply influenced by the Westminster model of parliamentarianism, and they were deeply committed to human rights and the right of an individual to dissent. And these were put deeply into our constitution, but more importantly, into our consciousness. When I was at school, I can't remember a single boy 
saying a single thing against the Muslim community. And yet today, in the same school, it's a handful of boys who are talking about secularism, while the rest are falling into anti-Muslim moods. So, um, there, is, there, was, there is something to the, the freedom movement was the creation of a nation and the creation of a history. Now that history is one which traces itself back to the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda has a verse in which it says, after describing nature and mountains and rivers and the sea, it says, who created all this? And the answer it gives is, only he knows. And then comes the punchline, which says, and perhaps even he doesn't know. Now, Nehru picked up these lines. And his discovery of India begins with the discovery of skepticism in India. We never had a firm belief that only this is right and everything else is wrong. And it is that which is the characteristic of, of India as a civilization. But India today calls itself a Vishwaguru. Vishwaguru? And we are not able to keep the people, 200 million Indians, feel that this is their country? Vishwaguru? And you tell me that I have to speak Hindi? Yeah, I do speak Hindi. But that's a voluntary decision. It's not imposed on me. I'm told that if I'm not in Ayodhya on the 22nd of January, I'm not going to be a good Hindu. Well, I'm not a good Hindu anyway, but I don't see what business it is of the government <coughs> as to whether I am a Hindu, a good Hindu, a bad Hindu. And yet, these are becoming the markers of our national character. And that is why it has to be stopped. Because if it's not stopped in 2024, then by the time we come to 2029, or worse still, 2039, we may be as different an India, or perhaps an India that doesn't exist at all, than we were up to 2014. And so this election is not only a question of whom do you want ruling this country for the next five years, but also a question of whom do you want or what kind of an India do you want in 50 years from now? Are we to be in 2047, 100 years after we became independent, a totally different country or an even better version of the India we were in 1947? Thank you for that. Uh, I go back to the question that I raised because I was a little curious to know because these were three different kinds of dictatorships, right, in Vietnam and uh, in Karachi and uh, Baghdad. So how was it to think of them as different ways of maybe, you know, dealing with power, disbursing power relationships? So, I mean, you as a diplomat might have had a certain kind of a critique to these different varieties of dictatorships. So I particularly wanted you to... My fundamental position was then and is now that democracy is a bad form of government, but it's better than all, all other forms of government are worse. So Vietnam was... I, I was in North Vietnam. And North Vietnam was being bombed on a daily basis by these savages who are called Americans. And the per person most responsible for it happily died last month, Henry Kissinger. So the kind of barbarity that one saw among the Americans who were to be seen only 60,000 feet up in the sky was this bomb culture. They had no compunctions about killing an entire people in order to promote some ideology. And I was witness to the firm determination with which they said, which meant that nothing is more important than independence and freedom. That was uh, Ho Chi Minh's slogan. And since nothing was more important than independence and freedom, 
the people of North Vietnam voluntarily <coughs> gave themselves over to the command, the military command of Ho Nguyen Zap and the political command of Ho Chi Minh. And in the end, they won. In fact, I tell a little story here of a British vice consul who came to have dinner with me and pointing to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which started just outside the house, he said, how will these guys on bicycles ever be able to take on an American Air Force where a U-2 flies 60,000 feet above North Vietnam and crosses the entire country in 10 minutes? And he picked up the saucer on which my coffee cup was kept. And he said, and takes a photograph of the saucer, which shows the rim more correctly than your eyes are able to see it. Well, it was the guys on bicycles who won. So there, there was a dictatorship necessitated by the need to fight dictatorship. But I said to them then that now that they've come to power, or they'll come to power on the basis of the gun, they'll never let the gun go. And although Vietnam today is a very different country to the one I served in in 1968, um, the fact is that those who won by the gun never let go the gun. So that is not the kind of country in which I would like to live. In Iraq, we had a most enlightened leader in many ways in Saddam Hussein. Uh, in the middle of the Arab world, he had a whole series, I mentioned their names in the book, their positions in the book, a whole series of women who were heading really important organizations like the State Organization of Industrial Housing, the Legal Council of the State Organization of Housing, the uh, purchase manager of the cement company with which I was dealing. And he had Mustan Sariya University past which I would drive every day at the end of my day. And then it was like the Sorbonne. There were these boys and girls sitting, chatting with each other. And you could, you had a sense that women were being liberated by this man. Equally, he had a very keen sense that he, ra he ran a country that was composed of Shias and Sunnis who were dead opposed to each other. And yet he succeeded in bringing both communities together in a very, very difficult situation when Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, Shia kingdom, was rising in front of him. And that's what led to his ultimate disaster. There were also Armenians and other Christian communities. Indeed, there was an Iraqi Jewish community. And they were all treated very, very well. <coughs> so, it was a dictatorship which was vicious, vicious. If you made a traffic mistake, the police would just kick you in the intestines till you almost died. There was, a, there was a particular individual I knew well, all of us did. He was the head of the planning commission. He went down to tell a British visitor to him that he couldn't meet him because the previous day, instructions had been received from the uh, foreign office that nobody is allowed to meet a foreigner without the prior permission of the foreign office. So just courteously he went down to receive him at the reception and said, I can't see you now, I'll let you know when I can. But when he came up in the lift, he was arrested on the spot and they returned the body after torture to the family because when they did return the body after torture, they would return it only if they were convinced that he was innocent. If he was guilty, the body wouldn't be returned. And that's how you knew whether you'd been killed necessarily or unnecessarily. And as against all this, I arrive in Pakistan, which is allegedly under a dictator. And looking at the way in which people drank, the amount of alcohol they consumed, so much alcohol they consumed that when I had finished three years in Karachi and the foreign secretary asked me what quality he should look for in my successor, I said only one, sir, a very strong liver. So he said, a strong liver? I said, I know exactly where uh, the Darul Islam ends 
and the Darul Ulum begins, the other one, the Darul Hat begins. He said, where? I said, it's the bar of the synth club. South of that, I said, north of that is Ziyadam, and south of that is freedom. And so, they used to crack Zia jokes. Unfortunately, I'm sitting with a lady, and there's a mixed crowd here, so I can't repeat any of those jokes to you. But in the middle of this dictatorship, this kind of talk is taking place, and it's taking place freely. And I, as an Indian diplomat, am supposed to be an enemy, and yet there is not a single Pakistani who does not with enthusiasm accept my request to meet him, and then is completely open and free, and talks to me about what? About how will India give them <coughs> give them succor in, uh, Raj in the Rajasthan desert. I say, yeah, if you start a revolution. And then I told Hafiz Pirzada, who asked me for sanctuaries, I said, Hafiz, the only revolution you'll ever make is when you stir your sugar in your coffee. So uh, the thing is that it was, there was a lady called Amy Huck, whose husband was a cricketer of very high distinction, lived in Dubai like you do. And uh, they, after the Nizam -e Mustafa, uh, they just raided her house and they found several bottles of whiskey. And a big story was made of it in the evening papers. <laughs> Next day, comes a coda to the Nizam to the Nizam Mustafa. It says that an Englishman's home is his castle. And Zia orders his police not to go into any private home to look for alcohol. So it was a very relaxed dictatorship to the point where I once remarked to someone that, uh, you know, we run an inefficient democracy in India and you run an inefficient dictatorship in Pakistan, with the result that the net level of freedom in the two countries is more or less the same. And this got proved to me beyond question when, towards the fag end of my stay in Karachi, my driver, who was a Pakistani and very disciplined, he turned up late on a day when I had an early morning appointment. So I was infuriated, I screamed at him, and after I calmed down, he said, can I explain to you why I'm late? So I said, yes. And he said, my brother was arrested in Delhi colony last night. I said, really, why? He said he was showing Hindi films on a 16 millimeter projector and the police came and caught him. So I said, what did you do? He said, I was told about it this morning. So I worked to the police thana. And I told the policeman there, please release my brother. And the man looked at him and said, who the hell are you? And Sattar replied, who am I? He said, I am the driver of the Hindustan Consul General. I said, really? In that case, you can take your brother. <laughs> so this was the kind of atmosphere in which I worked in Pakistan. And Therefore, although it was a dictatorship, all the stories I heard about Bhutto's rule showed that life was much more difficult and much more dangerous for an individual who bucked Mr. Bhutto than it was for ordinary citizens in, uh, under Zia al Haq. So there were three democracy dictatorships, yes. Uh, I would certainly not want my country to imitate either the Vietnam model or the Iraq model or the Pakistan model. But I fear we are creating our own model and that by 2029, the smile of superiority on my face it might well get wiped out. Thank you. That was a fascinating insight into the fact that dictatorships come in all colors and sizes and you know, ideologies. The part that I loved most about your book, and I think that's one reason why we should read Memoirs of a Maverick, the section on Pakistan. It comes out as an altogether different country from the popular imaginaries in India. Here where today when we watch a cricket match, for example, even by mistake we cannot support 
Pakistan team, Pakistan's team, even if they are, you know, sometimes they have a better kind of a display of sportsmanship. So this is the reason why I particularly want you to dwell upon this section because I think that the Pakistan you delineate and you describe is very different from the popular imagination of Pakistan that we have been fed with. If it had only been the popular imagination, then I think the popular imagination could be taught. But if you look at the Ministry of External Affairs, and if you look at those who are concerned with our security, all of them have an ide fix about Pakistan, and they're very reluctant to move out of it, because if Pakistan did not exist, there would be very little reason for this National Security Advisor to exist. There'd be very little reason to have an army chief. Therefore, the establishment in India, including parts of the journalist establishment, have such a vested interest in having enmity with Pakistan that they tend to look, tend to think the Pakistanis are a mirror image of themselves. They tell us what would be, what is the use of the Pakistan army except to attack India? Well, what's the use of the Indian army except to attack Pakistan? So therefore, and now that China and Pakistan have got allied, it really, there's, there's, a par, there's a chin park that we are faced with and not with just Pakistan. But the argument holds there too. The foreign office of India to which I belong and to which I owe my loyalty is, knows how to deal with Paraguay. But they're completely at sea when it comes to Pakistan. Because unlike in most other countries, there is a huge gap in the perception of India between the people of Pakistan and the establishment of Pakistan. And we don't seem to realize that our single biggest asset in Pakistan is the people of Pakistan. And the proof of that is that although apparently, according to Mr. Jinnah, Hindus and Muslims could not live together in India, his two-nation theory ends in Dubai where half the population is Pakistani and half is Indian, and there's never been a communal riot. It's just not allowed. And that's another dictatorship which is well worth emulating. So therefore, I go back to my very first, the, my first happening in Pakistan. It was, this is a string of three stories, so you'll have to bear with me please, a little. Please. I arrived in Karachi at Sir, about one, one o'clock in the afternoon, and I was at my desk by 2 p.m. in the afternoon. The whole office had been de-degenerating de 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 since the 1965 war, so the walk workers were swarming all around the premises, and everyone from the Chaprasi to me had one little room, and we had one telephone among us. That telephone rang, and uh, my clerk said to me in a somewhat surprised office, Sir, it's from the office of the Deputy Commissioner of Sakkar. So I heard Deputy Commissioner of Sakkar, why is he calling me? Anyway, I picked up the phone, and there was a woebegone voice at the other end who described himself as the liaison officer to a Hindu sadhu who had been brought back to Sakkar to an island called Sardbela, just to the west of Sakkar, in order to provide pravachan to the Hindu community of Upper Sin. This was at the request, special request of L.K. Advani. And this guy was the liaison officer to that Hindu son. And his, he was in a terrible state because he said, Sir, the Muslim murids, that is the Muslim followers of your Hindu sadhu, want to meet him. What do I do? So I said, what do you do? What's your problem? So he says, sir, how can I let them meet him? I just decided that my first job in Pakistan would be to tell the Pakistani liaison officer to allow his, the Pakistani murids of the Hindu saint to meet the Hindu saint. 
this was the Pakistan to which I was introduced within 15 minutes of taking up my post. Then the second story. We were invited, my wife and I, to a dinner party. And at the dinner party, I was seated next to a rather taciturn Pakistani. So I thought I'd begin some kind of a conversation with him. So I asked him a rather banal question. <coughs> I said, have you ever been to India? And his answer was yes. And then he just wouldn't continue. So I had to continue the conversation. So I said, really? And where did you go? And he said, Merit. So I said, Merit, I see. And how long were you there? And he looked at me dolefully and said, three years. I then realized that he was a prisoner of war. So my face absolutely fell when I found that I was chatting about India with one of our prisoners of war. And he smiled at me when he saw my expression and said, you know, there's an excellent bottle of port laid down in the cellar of the Sin Club. If your wife and you would kindly have dinner with me like tomorrow night, then you as a Hindu can sign the bill, we can sign the chit, and I'll pay for it, and we can all have the bottle of port. So we had a most convivial evening with this ex-prisoner of war. And as we were coming, walking back to our residence, which is not too far away, Sunit, who was with me, my wife, she turned to me and said, this is an enemy country, right? And for the next three years, I kept, that question kept going round and round in my mind. Is Pakistan really an enemy country? And to answer it, in the last 40 years, 42 years that I've been back from Pakistan, I have visited Pakistan about 40 times. And I have met with people, not only in Karachi, but also in northern and western and eastern Pakistan. And every time I meet a new Pakistani face, it's Sunit's question that comes into my mind. Is this an enemy country? They're so friendly. They're so interested in India. They're so committed to a peaceful, <coughs> self-respecting relationship with us that I just don't understand why we cannot leverage them as our single biggest asset in that country. And this opinion among the ordinary people of Pakistan spreads also to elements of their foreign service, to elements of their army, and to a section of the uh, the, uh, the, pol the politicians. And, but if you go on insulting them, if you say, I will not talk to you, but I will conduct surgical strikes, well, what is there, uh, what can they do except say, in that case, you are behaving like an enemy, so I'll behave like an enemy. Gandhiji said, and he converted Jesus' uh, moral injunction into a political philosophy when he said, turn the other cheek. I don't see if you, if there is a goodwill blitzkrieg towards Pakistan, there is no country in the world which would respond more affectionately towards us than Pakistan. And by exactly the same token, if you go on insulting them by saying, I won't even talk to you, kutti. I mean, it's like, a, like children in a playground. Naturally, they turn around and say kutti to you. So therefore, we seem to have taken the wrong path. We took the right path, I think, from 1947 to 1971. Because at that time, it was a very different Pakistan. But after Pakistan was defeated, in, and comprehensively so, in 1971, they suddenly realized that they had been fed with a lot, a lot of wrong notions. Notions like one Muslim is equal to four Hindu soldiers. And sometimes that four became 40, and occasionally it became 400. And then there was the slogan, Ki kal sham tak lal ke la, kal sham tak Islam ka jhanda lal ke le par leherayega. That till by tomorrow evening, the flag of Islam will fly over the red fort in Delhi. 
they realized that all this was rubbish propaganda being fed to them. And so we were very lucky that we got involved with Pakistan at that time. And at that time, the desire to make some kind of friendship with India was so great that Ziaul Haq met Rajiv Gandhi six times in 1985, the year that Rajiv became Prime Minister. And they subsequently, in an interview given after Ziaul Haq died, Rajiv said it was so much easier to deal with a hawk in Pakistan than to deal with a dove. Because the hawk would have the establishment behind him, whereas a dove would be fighting against the establishment. And it was in this light that he said that even in the northern regions of Kashmir, the Siachen question, he had almost arrived at a solution with Zia. And it was Zia's death in that air accident, the case of exploding mangoes, that brought that initiative to an end. And he said this in the context of his attempt to tell Benazir that I was, he said it publicly in a banquet speech, that when we became independent, I was only a child and you were not yet born. So it falls to us to avail of the goodwill that exists between our peoples to convert that into a good relationship between our countries. But then Benazir was knocked out by the army. The only time we have succeeded in coming to agreements with Pakistan, which have lasted, are under military dictators. It's under Ayub Khan that we settled the Indus Waters Treaty, and not this, notwithstanding four different wars, that treaty has lasted. It's still being operated. Equally, under Zia al Haq, he visited India half a dozen times with no reciprocal visit. And when Operation Blue Black Brass Tax took place and the Pakistanis got alarmed, he immediately agreed to come to Delhi and sort things out. Parvez Musharraf, despite being having the door slammed firmly in his face in Agra, initiated the dialogue that resulted in a virtual solution to the Kashmir issue. And under civilian dictators, because they're all dictators, under civilian dictators, we get nowhere. Whether it was Jinnah or Liaqat Ali Khan or any of the numerous prime ministers who followed, or Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who wanted to fight a thousand years war with India, or under the recent lot, who for the last decade or so have been running Islamabad, there is no sign that they are, want to or are capable of conducting a structured dialogue with us. So therefore, I think our foreign office is wrong in underestimating the people's goodwill for India, and I think they're also wrong in wanting to have a civilian government in Pakistan before we start a dialogue with them. Thank you. I think uh, those sections of the book were profoundly revelatory to me as an academic, and I think these are sections that should be dwelt upon uh, in India and maybe even taught uh, to in the schools because I think students should awaken to those kinds of possibilities and different readings especially given the fact that there is a method in this madness. Uh, there is a, definitely a method in this madness because the otherization of nations is also part of the larger schema of otherization of communities, of certain communities, right? It's integral to it. This government has been so othering the Muslims that how can they reconcile othering Indian Muslims by making friends with Pakistani Muslims. So they've converted Pakistan from being a question of external affairs into a question of being Indian affairs. And in this, the victims are the Indian Muslims. And the Indian Muslim has never felt as alienated from New Delhi as he is feeling today. And that is probably the reason why in the last decade of this last, these last 10 years, this must be my 10th or 12th visit to Calicut. It's the Muslims who keep calling me, the Indian Union Muslim League. It's not the Congress that calls me. It's the IOML, 
and the education society is run by the Muslims because they feel here is one friend. Now, why should they feel that? They should feel that all Indians of whatever community are their friends. That is their right. They have demonstrated their patriotism by not emigrating to Pakistan. I, as a non-Muslim, did not have the option of emigrating to Pakistan. So I necessarily became an Indian. But these people had the option. They had the option of becoming Pakistani. They deliberately refused it. They remained on in India. And yet for their patriotism, they're being punished today. It's unbelievable that this should be done in our country. And equally, there are 3,000 Christians who have objected to the 100 Christians who attended Modi's Christmas party. Their, their petition is out on the internet. So therefore, the minorities of India, instead of being made to feel a part of our country, which is what unity and diversity is all about, first you attack people on the basis of religion, then you attack people on the basis of caste, then you attack people on the basis of culture. He doesn't, we have a prime minister who has not even once visited Manipur, where the Christians have been under siege by a party colleague of the prime ministers for the last eight months. It's, it's never happened before. And uh, it's all very well to walk on the sands of Lakshadweep. But that is no substitute for reaching out to the Muslims. Why is there no Eid party? There's never been an Eid party in the last 10 years involving the Prime Minister. And on the one occasion when he went as Chief Minister, he refused to wear the skull cap, saying that this would be identifying him as an Islam, as a Muslim. Now, if you can wear any hornbills that are given to you in the Northeast, and you can wear pagdis when you're in Punjab, why not wear a skull cap at an Eid party? What's the problem? That is the problem. That is the problem. And we therefore, I mean, I've penned this book partly to show that it is possible to be an honorable Indian without being a communist. And that I've included the sentence in the book. It's from Rajiv Gandhi, who Suomoto uh, initiated a debate in Parliament on the 3rd of May, 1989, in which he began his speech by saying that India survives because of its secularism. And the next sentence said, and perhaps an India that is not secular would not deserve to survive. I think that is the philosophy to which we have to go back. Our policies will, of course, have to be conditioned by whatever are the current realities. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, one question that I really wanted to, one particular uh, section within the chapter that I particularly wanted to dwell upon was the day you graphically describe the, I mean, the, the, the graphic description of Karachi after Bhutto's hanging. Yeah. Well, our embassy in, uh, in Islamabad was completely convinced that if Bhutto was hanged, then Pakistan would rise in revolt against the military. I arrived in Karachi just about six weeks, no, uh, six weeks before the Supreme Court gave its final judgment and about four months before Bhutto was hanged. And everywhere I went, I was encountering stories about what injustices uh, Bhutto had done. There were no pro-Bhutto stories, <coughs> although <coughs> my very closest friends were all PPP and they were all lieutenants of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. One of my best friends there was such a close friend of Zulfi Bhutto. His name <coughs> was Ilahi Baksh Sumro. He's still there. He's 95 years old. He's still alive. Ilahi Baksh Sumro was so close to Zulfi, they, are, they were adjacent landlords in Shikarpur in Larkana, 
that when Bhutto wanted to marry an Iranian Shia and couldn't find a priest who would do the wedding, it was Ilahi Baksh who found the priest who would conduct the wedding not in Karachi but in Quetta under the Khan of Kalat. Now this chap, Ilahi Baksh, was going around his, his farmlands when the superintendent of police drove up to him, saluted smartly, and informed him that he was under arrest. So Eli Buck said, why am I under arrest? And the superintendent of police said, I don't know, but we'll tell you when you get to the Sucker Central Jail. So he was taken to the Sucker Central Jail, and the warden there looked at the register and said that I've been ordered to keep the register, three registers open, the decoity, rape, and murder. And he says, they'll tell me later how to fill it in. But for the moment, I'm putting you under arrest. And then Eli Bucks remained under arrest until one day the warden told him that you become the deputy high commissioner in London. So come out and go to the airport directly. And this is the kind of bizarre way in which Bhutto was running the country. Uh, there are many, many stories about Bhutto's excesses in the book, which I picked up at that time. But I was convinced that, uh, it, that if Bhutto is hanged, there will not be an adverse reaction. And Kushwan Singh was convinced that there would be a reaction. And he'd missed the hanging, much to his regret. So on the 40th day, which is called Chehlum among the Islam Muslims, he arrived in Karachi for Chehlum and said to me at the airport, that he didn't want to come to our house, he wanted to go all around the city. So I took him everywhere, I took him everywhere, and everything was perfectly calm, there was no reaction at all, and he finally gave up when we arrived at the Bhage Jinnah and found that there was a boy, of, there was a set of boys playing cricket. At that point he realized that there was going to be no revolution in Pakistan. So, uh, it was, I was right and the embassy was wrong. Usually, the embassy was wrong and I was right. <laughs> and that's what made me absolutely certain that I'd never make it to foreign secretary because I kept having my own view of things. I keep, kept making my own mind up. And the one thing the civil service does not like is somebody who makes up his own mind. You have to be a patient servant of the government. And the government will tell you, eat your spinach and you eat your spinach. It says, drop your peas and you drop your peas. And there I was saying, why shouldn't I eat my spinach and why should I drop my peas? So I knew, especially as my career was blotted with this association with Rajiv Gandhi, that if we got a non-Rajiv government, that would be my end. It happened to one of my colleagues, a man called G. Parthasarathy. He, was, he remained on and he was posted by VP Singh as our High Commissioner to Cyprus. And I said, that's the right decision. I approve of it. Half a man to half a country. <laughs> so that would have been, I'm sure I would have ended up in Mozambique or somewhere. And therefore, I decided in a maverick fashion to jump ship before somebody leaked, made it leak. There are many, many other fascinating aspects that, you know, um, Mr. Manishankaraya covers in the book. We are running short of time. I am sure that there are a few questions, particularly that section on Rajiv Gandhi and the, the crisis, the three crises that he faced, uh, you know, Bofors. There will be plenty of time to discuss yeah, that. Yeah, discuss that. The next book, which is already out, it's called The Rajiv I Knew, and it has a subtitle, and why he was India's most misunderstood Prime Minister. Prime Minister. That contains all the answers to your questions. And tomorrow, there is a session on that book. So, I would say rather than ask the Rajiv questions this time, if there are any questions you would like to ask about yes. uh, the rest of the book, you're welcome to do so. I wish there were more listeners to this, you know. I think he covered some groundbreaking ideas and things. So, anyone, anyone with any pressing question? Yes, please. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mani, for taking us on this wonderful, memorable, memorable journey with wide-ranging perspectives. I can completely agree with you on your views on Pakistan and how the people are so friendly. That's exactly how I found them when I went there, and the problem is entirely the creation of the two governments. People to people, so friendly. I've known you for like 40 years or something, and one of the things I learned was your fantastic memory. This book with 500,000 words, how much of it was written from your memory and were there some notes that you had taken along your way? No, I didn't keep a diary. And uh, in any case, much of this book could not have entered a diary, it could have only entered a book. But uh, especially when it comes to this second volume, I had to do a lot of research. Uh, including, I did a lot of research and got a lot of documents. I did check them out. In fact, the checking process continues now. I see that there have been one or two mistakes of a substantive kind that have entered this book. I'll try and correct it when a second edition comes out. Uh, but uh, my 90, I would say 90% of it is my memory and perhaps 10% of it has been inspired by my remembering where I could find things. So I troubled the Dune School, I, I troubled the Wellam School archives to find the first essay I'd ever written which was printed when I was nine years old. I found several articles I'd written for the Dune School Weekly. I certainly found one of my favorite pieces which is my memoirs of college which you didn't ask me about. I had to check on one or two things on my Cambridge chapter, but that too was largely on memory. And as far as the Foreign Service career, especially my coming into it was concerned, I was not allowed to use any documents because they're all kept confidential forever. In, unlike in England where they have a 30-year rule, now we can't access our documents. So those had to be done either by chatting with colleagues or by, or by just remembering. And it's amazing how when you think back, memories that have gone deep into your subconscious, they surface. And I wish they'd surfaced less because then this book would have been more manageable. But as it is, it went into three volumes now. Thank you. I think we are seriously running out of time. Yeah. No, but the... Organizers are not permitting. Maybe you can ask him that question outside once this is over. I'm so sorry because they are not permitting it. It's time for the next session. It's a wonderful session and I think it's a brilliant critique. The book is a brilliant critique of the contemporary times that we live in India. Uh, it raises some serious questions about the jingoisms that are doing its round now. Thank you so much. I really look forward to your session tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That was Dr. Meena Tipilai having a conversation.